Over the last decade, EVs have become sensible. However, they don't work for everyone, and the seemingly obvious solution is a plug-in hybrid. But I'd argue in most cases, they make even less sense. Today, I'm going to explain why, and I'm going to desperately try to not rant. First, the goal of an electric vehicle is to reduce your fuel costs and emissions. And to avoid any confusion, EVs are cleaner than internal combustion. Even when you consider the emissions of production and if your electricity is supplied by fossil fuels. If you have any additional questions, I will link a video in the description by the amazing Engineering Explained that goes into the details of why that is. That's also not the point of today's video. EVs don't work super well in the US for a few reasons. I'd say the largest are access to charge charging, charging speed, price, and then for some, range. The average commute in the US is 41 miles, which is no challenge to any new EV. A lot of people somewhat regularly travel hundreds of miles to attend special meetings, see family members, or just go on a road trip. Something that isn't a hard stop limitation for EV owners, but due to our current infrastructure, it can make things a pain in the ass. So in comes plug-in hybrid vehicles, which provide a short electric range to clean your conscience of baby polar bears and greatly reduce your monthly gas costs while still providing all of the flexibility of an internal combustion car for longer distances. This is exactly what we wanted, right? Right? I've driven a few of these, researched many, and heard from owners too. The truth is complicated, and the level of commitment varies brand to brand. The first thing I want to point out is less of a limitation and more of a nuisance, but that is going to be the unimpressive range. I mean, some of these things 20 miles is what you're getting out of them. Most are still 30 miles. The best out there, you're gonna get about 40 miles, which again, not a limitation because you still have internal combustion. But after that, you're left with a vehicle that's nine times out of 10 less efficient than a standard hybrid with a much heavier battery that we'll get into here soon. The charging is also embarrassingly slow in most of them. I believe Range Rover and Mitsubishi offer DC fast charging. That Mitsubishi is able to do that because it has a liquid liquid cooled battery. Without fast charging on a standard level two charger, you're talking a three kilowatt charging rate, which takes the Sunday from 15% to 100% in over four hours. On a standard wall outlet, 11. That means plugging in for 30 minutes at the grocery store level two unit would maybe add a few miles to your range. And temperature is also going to affect your range and your charging, though I will say even with the AC on, I was still able to hit about 30 miles before I was depleted of my driving range. The engine still needed to kick on sometimes during that because of the next somewhat common problem with these things. Embarrassing electric horsepower. This this Hyundai has 90 horsepower for 4,600 pounds. So it'd be borderline dangerous if the gas engine didn't automatically turn on. And as you drain the battery more, you'll notice that the engine kicks on a lot sooner. So it becomes difficult to not use gas. Still, when I played my cards right, I was able to get well over 200 miles per gallon in my 40 mile drive. Now at the same time, it does cost money to fill up that battery each night, just less than what it would be if I was filling up a tank. So overall, still an advantage it's just often not the EV experience many would expect. And the Hyundai isn't the only one in need of some performance enhancing pills. Other vehicles like the Ford Escape plug-in hybrid, which does have a better range, also struggles under its regular electric power. Even the BMW 3 Series plug-in is low on electric ponies. Some of the best performers out there like the RAV4 Prime, or again, that Mitsubishi, provide more than enough power under electricity alone. So the engine may not have to fire on at all, and they have great ranges. But the next problem is pretty much across the board, and that is weight. And actually, two kinds of weight. I'll get into the second one later. So you'd think with a battery capacity of around 10 to 20 kilowatt hours that these would weigh less than an EV with five to eight times that. But no, these things are pigs. The Hyundai is not alone. The Mitsubishi weighs 4,700 pounds. That is like 900 pounds more than the regular Outlander gas. You may think, well, what's the big deal with it? Well, I mean, there's not an inherent problem with that outside of the compensation that you need to do within the suspension to make sure that it still handles all right. So you're gonna have to stiffen it a ton. Now, some of these don't put on as much weight as others, but I drove the regular Santa Fe back to back with the Santa Fe plug-in, and there really was a noticeable difference in ride quality. And your regular EVs are often lighter with more power, and it'll have a lower center of gravity. And then once you deplete that range that is 
is sometimes very short, you're now left with a standard hybrid vehicle that's going to get worse gas mileage than a regular hybrid vehicle because of its heft. And if you're not charging it when it's low, it's sort of pointless. And with all of these added components, the next thing that is a pretty obvious downside is the price, which is one of the big problems with regular electric vehicles. They're not very attainable for average folks, and the plugins are no better. In fact, a lot of cases, I would say they're worse. Now, I hate to keep using Tesla here, but they are still really the standard when it comes to EVs. The Model Y costs near the same amount as a Santa Fe hybrid or the Outlander plug-in hybrid when you load them up. And with the long range model, you have a very usable 300 plus miles, way more performance, and then the clout of a Tesla if you're into that thing. Now, personally, I prefer the interior of a lot of PHEVs over Teslas. But when you consider that they often have a practicality advantage, it really becomes difficult to argue against that electric vehicle because if you buy either a PHEV or an EV, you really want to have regular access to charging. So if you have that, the only instance where I wouldn't just buy the Tesla or Ford Mustang Mach-E or even a VW ID4 is if I'm very regularly traveling 250 plus miles round trip. But wait, there's more. The thing that makes me want to scream at the top of my lungs is how hard these things can be to buy, especially the good ones. Because let's face it, the Toyota RAV4 Prime, the Prius Prime, those make some of the most compelling arguments of any PHEV because they have that 40 miles of range, they come in at a good price, and they offer great performance without sacrificing much of anything else. But Toyota won't slash can't really build all that many of them. So there's way higher demand than what they can currently supply. And dealerships are abusing this like a pair of Walmart jeans in Toyota will not do anything about it. So that second uh, wait that I was referring to is a wait time. You have to wait a really long time for a RAV4 Prime if you don't want to get completely screwed over on the price. A lot of times people are paying well over $50,000 for these things. And guys, Tesla doesn't do any of that. There's no markup. I actually called the Indianapolis Tesla here and they say they do price deductions on anything they have in the inventory. And they said they had like over 10 Model 3s in stock. And then the order turnaround time, two to five weeks. And then I asked them, what about buying in California? And with Tesla, the price remains the same unless I really need that range extension. And on a regular basis, I am not driving very far. It really makes the appeal to the PHEV much more niche when full-blown electric vehicles are making much stronger arguments for themselves. Now, I think a lot of these luxurious PHEVs make more sense because many of those will also offer adaptive suspensions to kind of compensate for the weight. Luxury cars are not about a value proposition. So the additional cost for the extra components isn't a big deal. And then the last thing I wanna talk about is the longevity. Because let's face it, batteries, I mean, historically with regular hybrids, it's been about 12 to 15 years. Some Teslas have gone well over 200,000 miles before they've replaced the batteries. Some haven't. PHEVs like the Volt, if you wanted to replace the battery in that, I mean, some people are saying it costs like $8,000 to do that. If you get 200,000 miles in 12 to 15 years out of that, eight grand is still a lot of money. Now, a Tesla, that's gonna cost you like 15, sometimes like 20 grand to replace the battery, but you also never had to pay for gas, and there would be much less maintenance in the first, you know, hopefully 200 something thousand miles. I'm also concerned for the internal combustion side of things. This is less of a worry if the plug-in has enough power to keep the engine off. PHEVs like the Outlander and the Toyota don't concern me. Now I'm sure there are a lot of happy plug-in owners, and I'm not saying as a whole it's a stupid buying decision, but now after reviewing more of them, driving this one for a week, and researching others, there are many compromises to most. That's not to say they're all as optimistically dumb as deer whistles for cars. A few are easy to find without paying over sticker, like the Mitsubishi, Kia Nero, and Mazda CX-9. And for specific lifestyles, some of them make a whole lot of sense. However, excluding specific models and scenarios, I find it much easier to recommend a hybrid or a full-on EV. They are all more green than their ICE counterparts, but that too is a little bit of a facade. The best way to reduce your carbon footprint is not to buy an EV, but rather it's to shorten your commute or take a train, or live in a better planned city. Car dependency is the bigger issue. EVs are beneficial, yet I'd still consider them a band-aid solution. Even with a Tesla Model X, if you travel twice the distance as some dude with a Honda Pilot, you're not helping the environment, and that is really a, a talk for another day. So 
Thank you for sticking around. Let me know your thoughts on plug-in hybrids. Did I miss any points for or against them? Let me know in the comments section. If you want more fun, detailed car content without fluff, subscribe and hit the bell for notifications, like to help me take on the maniacal YouTube algorithm, and follow my Patreon for an additional podcast. I'll catch you in the next one.